begin our meeting, uh, I'd like to remind you all, if you haven't silenced your cell phones, to uh, go ahead and do that at this time, please. At this time, I would like to introduce Reverend, Reverend Jennifer Deaton, who is Rector of St. Stephen's Church in Indianola, and Vicar of St. John's in Leland, who will deliver the invocation. The invocation will be followed with an anthem presented by Rubenna Griffin, who is a Lynx associate with Delta Health Alliance. As Reverend Deaton comes to the podium, I would like to ask our audience to stand and please remain standing for God and country. Check to see if the Reverend. Okay, we'll let Paul Hollis uh, <laughs> <laughs> take care of our invitation. Okay, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for this time together. Lord, we thank you for the men and women that are gathered in this room and, and all the things that they do, not only for the Delta, but for Mississippi and for our country. Lord, we ask you to lead us through this next year and do what is pleasing in your eyes, always remembering that it is you that, that gets our blessings and that we are thankful for. Lord, we thank you once again for this beautiful day and being, being able to gather here today. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. and the presidential directors relative to a wide range of regional issues that are critically important to the economy of our region. The exchange in these officers' meetings is very significant and has created an atmosphere of collegiality among these new friends. Although I will not ask these officers and presidential directors to stand, their names are appearing on the screen at this time, and I would ask our audience to join me in expressing our appreciation to them with a round of applause. Since June, it has been my privilege to work with my friend, immediate past president of Delta Council, Paul Hollis, who now serves as chairman of the Delta Council Executive Committee. 
Paul has been a constant source of information and guidance to me and this organization during the past six months on the wide range of issues that we have tackled. Paul, at this time I'd like to turn the program over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, resolutions were forwarded to directors earlier this month and after review they were modified for proposed amendments. Committee chairmen and members have acted on these policies and we are prepared to ratify the resolutions at this time. In keeping with the committee recommendations, I will offer a motion that we adopt the Delta Council policy resolutions for our standing committees and ask for a second from the audience. All in favor saying aye. All opposed? The motion passes, Mr. President. I'd further like to express appreciation to all committee chairmen and vice chairmen of Delta Council for their participation in ongoing discussions and developments that have occurred throughout the year in our respective fields of work. Six committees met in the last four months to hear reports and address policies pertaining to foreign policy, flood control, transportation, cotton ginning, aquaculture, and economic development. Three more committees, Soil and Water, Health and Education, and Transportation, again will meet in January to, to discuss act upon important business pertaining to the Delta region and Delta Council. These meetings have been and will be necessary to meet the challenges of an increasingly heavy plate of items that impact the economy of the Mississippi Delta. First and foremost, it's, uh, it's with a large dose of disappointment as well as uh, anger to me that the Environmental Protection Agency has rescinded the 2020 letter which rescinded the previous 2008 veto of the Yazoo Backwater Project. In essence, that action puts a 2008 veto back in place and leaves the South Delta vulnerable to the flooding and devastation that it has experienced most for the last decade without any option to see any relief anytime soon. I would love to see these extreme environmental groups who have made a, a career of opposing this project to their friends in Congress and to the administration to come down to the South Delta and explain to us exactly what all these alternatives are for relief to flood protection. There has been and will be only one solution branding the misery for the people of the South Delta and that is a pumping plant that was designed 80 years ago as part of the overall Mississippi Rivers and Tributary Plan. Delta Council and I would like to thank the people of the Delta and many of our state and congressional leaders for working timelessly to solve the flooding solution of the Delta. And while this action by the Environmental Protection Agency will make it harder to achieve, you can be assured that Delta Council will not put this project on the back burner because to give up is to fail. And we're not going to give up. I do want to take time to particularly thank our senators, Cindy Hyde Smith, Roger Wicker, for their endless compassion and work toward this project. I also want to thank Hunt Shipman, Hunter Moorhead, two Mississippi boys who have worked so hard in Washington to get us to a point that we've probably never been as close to getting these pumps and without their help we wouldn't have achieved that. And least but and not and last but not least and I have a little connection with this. I do want to thank Peter Nimrod, the Levy Board staff, 
the board for all that they have done to get the word out, to try to educate people and their timeless work for this project. Peter could do all this in about half the time I can, but <laughs> if y'all have ever heard him talk, if you've ever seen his presentation, it is outstanding. But we'll also work for other parts of uh, Mississippi Delta in this region, including the Upper Yazoo Project. And y'all have heard me say this before, this whole Delta has to work as one. It all has to drain together, it all has to work together. So we're going to continue to work at Delta Council through our flood control committees to make sure that a lot of these projects that are long past being finished are completed. Under the guidance of Delta Strong and Delta Development Department Chairman Wade Litton of Greenwood, the Delta Strong program of work remains more relevant than ever. With three locations and a number of projects in the pipeline. Also under the leadership of Development Department Director Jerry Chavez, workforce training remains a critical focus for enhancing both business and individuals in the Mississippi Delta region. In transportation issues, Delta Council has resigned to the fact that there, be, there appears to be very little will for the legislature to look at passing a comprehensive transportation package. But we will certainly be engaged in discussions on how the infrastructure dollars coming down from Washington can have the biggest impact on our rural roads and bridges. We, we maintain our support for the four-laning of Mississippi Highway 6, the four-laning completion of US 61 between Leland and Vicksburg, and the continued emphasis from the US Congress and United States Department of Transportation for the completion of Interstate 69 through Mississippi, Arkansas, and Louisiana. We also applaud the Mississippi Department of Transportation for their commitment to begin finalizing the ANSDES US 82 bypass, and we look forward to that work beginning in 2022. We continue to face a dizzying array of new regulations and rulings coming from the administration including the wholesale change in crop protection policy, a rewriting of the waters of the U.S. rules, United States rules, a potential step up in basis that would have very serious impacts on Delta agriculture, and climate po policies that could potentially threaten the U.S. farm safety net. In an area that has seen a, a drastic de decrease in population over the last 40 years, it is fundamental that our country's agricultural and rural development priorities be in line with our abundant resource such, such as the land, our forest, our water, and our communities. The health of our agricultural research system in Mississippi, and specifically here at Stoneville campus, of Mississippi State University and the southeast area headquarters of the USDA ARS has never been stronger. Delta Council would like to pause now and recognize Dr. Steve Martin, who stepped in three years ago in an interim capacity to strengthen the research extension offices here at the Delta Research Center. Delta Research and Extension Center and, con and a continued strong partnership with Archie Tucker and the team at the USDA ARS. That partnership, known throughout the agricultural research world as the Stonewall Model, has served our largest industry in Mississippi well, and Dr. Martin's efforts to strengthen that model has been met with widespread acclaim. 
while it pains us to, stu to say that Dr. Martin is resuming his assignment on the main campus at Starkville as Deputy Administrator of the Extension Service, we cannot express how pleased we are that Dr. Mark Keenum, Vice President Dr. Keith Coble, and Extension Director Gary Jackson have tapped Dr. Jeff Gore, the longtime entomologist stationed here at Stonewall, who has been a true workhorse of the Delta agricultural history over the past two decades. Delta Council has enjoyed a long-standing working relationship with Dr. Gore and know that he will continue the priorities of Mississippi State University, their key partnerships, and an enhanced level of service to the Delta community. Let's give them a round of applause. Finally, as we look upon the horizon of 2022, we will likely begin dates, debates as we approach the 2023 Farm Bill discussions. While a midterm election looms large between now and then, yep, Delta Council will continue our advocacy for the strong safety net that has existed over the past 25 years where farmers look to the market to determine their planning decisions. We applaud any enhanced emphasis on strong agricultural conservation practices, which the Delta has been implementing successfully for many decades, but want to emphasize that those practices and policies should be in addition to, and not instead of, the Title I safety net for producers. I'd like to conclude my remarks noting that our own president, Patrick Johnson, has been named as chairman of the National Cotton Council's Farm Policy Task Force. Meanwhile, Delta Council leader Kirk Satterfield has begun serving a two-year term as chairman of the USA Rice Farmers Board of Directors. These two Delta Farm leaders are serving in critical roles on the national stage as we begin this debate, and we appreciate their leadership. As I conclude, I would like to ask the audience to join me in a moment of silent meditation to pay tribute to individuals and their families who have made a better Delta because of their many contributions to the welfare of our society, economy, in this region. This morning I had, the pre I had the privilege of presenting recognition to the families, friends of these outstanding Delta citizens, many of who have stayed for our meeting and are now in this room at this time. At this time, I would ask everyone to bow your heads for a moment to acknowledge our deep appreciation for the legacy of unselfish service which these individuals extend to the Delta during their lifetime. Amen. And now, Patrick, I will turn the program back over to you. Thank you. The sponsor of our 87th mid-year meeting has become widely known as one of the best and most reliable wireless communications providers across the country. The Creekmore family, Hugh Mina, and the entire C Spire staff have brought a sense of community and civic involvement into every county in the Mississippi Delta, as well as provided quality assurance to all of us who rely on wireless communication services for navigation systems on agricultural equipment, health care services through telehealth communications, and broadband technologies to the home, which are being driven by the ceasefire infrastructure. Please join me in welcoming Terrell Knight, Vice President for Government, Wireless, and Economic Development. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, again, my name is Terrell Knight. Uh, VP of uh, Government, Wireless, and Economic Development, Ceasefire. 
Uh, it's certainly great to see everybody here today in person for a change. It's a, it's a, it's a much, much needed event. You know, as a Mississippi owned and operated company, uh, we're certainly glad, Frank, to continue our support from Delta Council uh, and, and, and specifically this event. And it makes it real easy to do this as the Mississippi Delta is one of, if not the strongest market, wireless market in ceasefire. And that is, that is very, very important to us, and it's much appreciated. As a matter of fact, we were the very first wireless provider, I was telling Paul earlier today, that we were very, the very first wireless provider back in 1991 to basically provide the entire Delta with a wire, wireless service. And we continue to uh, invest here in the Mississippi Delta. As a matter of fact, we made an announcement uh, back uh, the first part of this year, I believe it was February of this year, that we were going to be investing one billion, that's not a million, one billion dollars uh, in our infrastructure, both our wireless infrastructure and our fiber op optic infrastructure uh, in Alabama, uh, parts of Alabama, and the entire state of Mississippi. Uh, we're in the process right now of overlaying our entire wireless network with 5G technology to provide uh, further high speed wireless internet. Uh, the other piece is our, our uh, fiber optics. We have about 15,000 miles of fiber optics in the ground here in the state of Mississippi now. We're adding about another 4,000 miles of that. A good chunk of that is going to be in the Delta. We're going to be providing uh, high speed internet, or, or wireless, not wireless internet, high speed internet to uh, uh, all the K 12 schools, uh, all state agencies, local governments that want that. And we're going to be going by every industrial park. We're going to be going by the vast majority of businesses to provide that much needed uh, choice in uh, high speed broadband internet. So I simply want to say on behalf of our owners and management team at Ceasefire, we appreciate all that you do, Frank, the uh, Delta Council board, all that you guys do, the Delta Council staff, and the Delta Strong members, all that you do to help make the Mississippi Delta a better place to live and work in the state of Mississippi. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, Terrell. We do appreciate C Spire and their support, Delta Council, and, and the region as a whole. At this time, I would like to introduce our featured speaker, Mr. Fitzhugh Elder, whose full biography can be found in your program. The first time I met Fitz was during the last Farm Bill debate when I accompanied Delta Council to a meeting in the Appropriations Committee room of the U.S. Capitol. It was an intimidating experience as we walked the halls passing U.S. Senators going back and forth about their work and then were escorted into our meeting space. Once there, Deputy Staff Director Fitz Elder led the meeting with absolute professionalism and knowledge befitting the historic significant venue. In the next Congress, I was not surprised when I turned on my television to see he was named Staff Director of the U.S. Senate Committee on Rules and Administration, which is a universally known and coveted position as Mayor of the Senate. What a great honor for someone who has been lauded his entire career for his extreme depth and execution as a senior staff member in Congress, especially on issues that impact agriculture and rural development, but who also is universally recognized and respected throughout that stately chamber among members and staff alike. You may recognize Fitz from the prominent role he played during the inauguration ceremonies this past January, January, where he was seen on television as President Trump and then President-elect Biden arrived at the Capitol and were escorted to the platform on the west front uh, of the Capitol. Fortunately for those of us in this room, Senator John Bozeman of Arkansas, who serves as the ranking member of the Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry, tapped Fitz to be his chief staff person as we head in to very uncertain times for U.S. agriculture and rural development. We can't be in any better hands than Fitzhugh Elder IV as we navigate those issues. 
It is my honor and privilege to welcome Fitz back to the Mississippi Delta today to give us his thoughts on those issues and the road ahead. Good morning. Uh, I really appreciate that very gracious uh, introduction. Uh, the video of the inauguration, I became very popular because of the jacket I was wearing. People would call the committee and say, where did he get that coat? Uh, so it's sort of odd. I don't know if that's what I wanted to be known for. Uh, it's really great to be with you here in person and in the Delta. Um, yesterday I flew into Memphis and I was driving down. I could just feel sort of this weight lifted from my shoulders. No, that wasn't in D.C. And unfortunately, I went to Doe's last night and I think I gained that all back. <laughs> uh, but, you know, frankly, I really do wish uh, I was not going back to D.C. this evening. Christmas in the Delta sounds much more appealing. Um, and because while well, this might be the most wonderful time of the year, that is not the case if you're in Washington, D.C. Um, I'd like to thank the board of the Delta Council, Frank and Patrick Johnson, for inviting me to join you guys today. Um, I congratulate Patrick on becoming the president this past summer of the Delta Council. Um, I'd also like to thank Tina Manning, um, who uh, has always been very gracious and helpful to me, and once again made this visit to Stoneville seamless. Um, as I was preparing for this, uh, I thought back to the people who have helped me along my way. Um, I, I'm getting older, I'm 46, I started in 1998. Um, I'm, of course, grateful to my current boss, Senator Bozeman from Arkansas, um, the ranking member of the Senate Agriculture Committee, and my former boss, Senator Blunt of Missouri, who gave me the opportunity to be the rural staff director and to, to do the work on the inauguration. Uh, but when I look back, uh, there are really two groups of people who stand out as having had a significant impact on my professional and personal life, and it's an interesting mix. It is Mormons and Mississippians. Um, and as a lifelong Episcopalian, and I would therefore be happy to discuss one evening over a drink how Mormons have helped me <laughs> along my way, but for today I'm going to focus on some of the Mississippians. I would not be where I am today if it was not for the trust, kindness, and generosity of people like Senator Cochran, Dr. Mark Keenum, Hunter Moorhead, Martha Scott Poindexter, Chip Morgan, Graham Harper, Carlisle Clark. And while this person's not a Mississippian, I know he's spent his life helping y'all, and that's Hunt Shipman. Uh, my relationships with, those in, with all those individuals started through work, but they have become some of my most treasured and valued personal relationships. Um, additionally, uh, I have been the recipient of random acts of kindness from people uh, in Mississippi. Uh, when, when there was a serious health concern in my family a number of years ago, John Lundy called me in a time of need to reassure me and to offer support. And Chip Morgan had the entirety of the Leland United Methodist Church praying for our family. And, I, and it helped, and I felt it. And that meant so much to me, and I'm very grateful for that. So I'm indebted to you and the people of Mississippi for helping me along my way. It is my desire to repay that debt, and hopefully my current position, I will be able to at least work off some of it. Uh, this, after, or this morning, I'm going to pretty much talk about a couple things. Um, the current situation in Washington, uh, Senator Bozeman's vision for the Farm Bill, next Farm Bill, and then I'd just like to offer a few observations uh, sort of in line with what Paul talked about earlier. Uh, but first, I want to say, you know, COVID obviously has challenged all of us. Um, you can't farm via Zoom. Um, you, went to the, you went to work, you planted a crop and harvested a crop, and you continued to do what you always do best. You showed up and you kept working. And so, you know, much thanks to you and your fellow farmers and ranchers who kept us fed and clothed over the last two years. And this appreciation also goes to the bankers and the seed dealers and the equipment retailers and all the others who are necessary to make American agriculture the miracle that it is. So, you know, thank you all for, for just keeping going, even when everybody else was teleworking, you weren't. Um, Talk about the current situation a little bit in Washington. Uh, you know, it really is hard to believe that 2021 is coming to an end. It, it's been, it seems like a, a relentless year. Um, I would not blame anyone if they were exhausted at this point. Uh, you know, a little recap. Within the first six weeks uh, of January, we had, you know, the events of January 6th, we had the inauguration, we had the second impeachment of President Trump, we had a new Biden administration, and we had a change in control of both the House and uh, Senate with the slimmest of margins. You know, since that point, We've had you know, substantial government spending, the magnitude of which we haven't seen in generations. 
you know, I like to tell people that I was an appropriator when a trillion dollars was a lot of money. Um, you've had supply chain disruptions, skyrocketing input costs. You know, if you look at anhydrous, I believe it's like $1,300 a ton, which is about a 200% increase over last year. Labor shortages, regulatory uncertainty. And I actually think it should be called regulatory certainty because I'm certain the administration wants to regulate you. Um, for right now, the federal government is currently funded through midnight tomorrow, although it looks like a deal was announced earlier this morning that will take us to February 18th. Um, you know, so Congress will not finish its work on the annual appropriations bills until next year. Um, the new fiscal year started on October 1st. Um, from, from a practical standpoint, what's that mean? You know, it means that the agencies that you work with, you know, ARRC, ARS, NRCS, FSA, RD, you know, they will continue to operate, but they'll be operating sort of like they were in 2021 from a financial standpoint. And that just makes Archie's life difficult at, uh, at here in Stovall uh, to start new projects, you know, um, until the, the fiscal year 2022 appropriations bill is enacted. Um, but that should happen in, in, uh, in February. Uh, before uh, December 15th, another issue that Congress faces is we actually have to increase the debt limit. You've probably heard about some of that um, in the news. It, it sounds like, um, because there's been very little news about that, that's actually a positive sign. I think it, what it means is that there are substantive conversations going on right now amongst the parties that make decisions. Um, and so that, that should happen um, and the full faith and credit of the United States will not be questioned. Uh, the next big issue you probably heard a lot about is the what's called the Reconciliation Bill or the Build Back Better Bill um, that, that the administration has pushed. It's currently about, a, the House passed it, it's about a $1.7 trillion bill. It fo focuses primarily on social infrastructure um, and tax policy changes. Um, this majority leader, Senator Schumer of New York, has said he would like to get that passed before Christmas. Um, I have to say, this, is, this has been a completely partisan um, exercise. This is the first time in my career that I have not been sort of consulted or notified about something major, a major piece of legislation that impact, impacts the committee of jurisdiction I'm working on. There's been, unfortunately, zero consultation with Republican senators. Um, initially, the, the package was about three and a half trillion dollars. Um, there is $28 billion in the House passed version for, cons for conservation. There are strings attached. Don't think that this is just like what we do in a farm bill, um, that this is just additional money like we've done in the farm bill. There will be a focus on climate change and, and other things. Um, so it's not just an additional money for CSP or EQIP or what have you. Um, and there's no clear answer if it will increase the baseline for the next farm bill. I know that's something that's been discussed, and that is that is a point that is not, that's been debated right now and I, there's really truly no resolution. I, we met with the Congressional Budget Office on this issue earlier this week and, and they were scratching their heads and they needed to consult with the Office of Management and Budget and they need to consult with other budget committee officials to determine sort of how that potentially may happen. Um, so there's a lot left to do uh, before the end of the year um, and you know we'll see, we'll see what's able to get done. I um, want to switch gears a little bit and talk about Senator Bozeman. Um, you know, when the retirement of Senator Pat Roberts of Kansas earlier this year, Senator Bozeman took over to be the senior Republican on the Agriculture Committee. Um, as you all know, Senator Bozeman's from Arkansas. He grew up in Fort Smith. He played football for the Razorbacks. Uh, he currently lives in northwest Arkansas in Rogers. Um, and he was a successful optometrist before becoming a House member and then a senator. Um, he is deeply, deeply interested and committed to agriculture and forestry and rural communities. Um, you know, I saw that firsthand. We did a tour in August and visited um, all parts of Arkansas. And he legitimately cares about production agriculture and the communities that, that um, are supported by that and that support those farmers. Um, he raised pulled heifers, uh, herfords, and likes to tell people that he's the only senator with an AI certificate, and that's not artificial intelligence. Um, you know, Arkansas Ag is much like Ag in Mississippi. They, we, we're just on the other side of the river. You know, rice, cotton, poultry, catfish, timber, soybeans, you know, these are our crops. And like Mississippi, we have rural counties who are losing population, we have poverty, um, and we need to improve our rural infrastructure. You know, Senator Bozeman comes from a place of shared understanding with Delta Farmers. Your views are important to him, and he wants and needs to hear from you, and I'll touch on that a little bit here later. 
Um, you know, I, obviously, Arkansas producers will always be his top priority. It's funny, when I got this job, a bunch of people from Mississippi were, were congratulating me. And uh, Ben Noble, who's at Riceland Foods in Stuttgart, uh, sent me a note and said, you just remember that Arkansas is number one now. Um, <laughs> you know, and so, uh, but believe me, there is a soft place in my heart for the Delta Council and the Mississippi Delta. Um, but, you know, he also, th he's unique though, because, you know, obviously Southern Ag and Arkansas Ag will always be his top priority. But he also believes he has a unique responsibility to be um, for agriculture, regardless of commodity and regardless of region. He thinks he has a responsibility to the greater, um, sort of the greater whole there. Um, and so we look forward, you know, to working with all commodities and all regions um, as we develop the next Farm Bill. You know, and for the Farm Bill, you know, from, from Senator Bozeman's perspective, our focus will be on you know, keeping what works and making changes to the things that don't. You know, I think evolution, not revolution. Um, our focus is on production ag. And family farm, or and farm family and rural community sustainability. You know, if if producers are not economically sustainable and the rural communities they live in are not economically viable, then all the discussions around environmental sustainability really don't matter. Um, we first have to make sure that it's profitable for you to make a living and that your communities are viable. Um, we certainly believe conservation uh, in conservation programs, and we believe that conservation should be primarily focused on working lands. You know, obviously there's a need for WRPR and CRP, but we want to help, you know, working lands, um, producers get the conservation money they need for their operations. Uh, we believe the safety net programs and crop insurance should remain focused on being safety net programs and crop insurance and not be transformed into some tool to coerce farmers into certain behaviors. Um, I personally would like the Farm Bill to spend some more time on ag disasters and see if we can find a better way to uh, deliver assistance in a timelier manner after natural disasters. It just seems absurd that you have a flood, Congress says they want to make, a, you know, provide some relief and it takes two years for you to get a payment. That's not, that's not acceptable. Um, and we'd, I'd like to see if we can fix that somehow. I think the single most important issue though for us is that we really want this to be a producer driven and producer informed process. We want there to be plenty of hearings, and we want there to be ample opportunities for farmers, those who live with the farm policy decisions Congress makes, uh, to let us know what their needs are, what your needs are. Um, I love all your representatives of Washington, D.C. They're great people, but they don't live with the decisions we make. Y'all do. And I think it's very important that we hear from, from producers about what is working and what is not working. Um, and I do think this is one place that Zoom will be helpful because it will allow us to take advantage of hearing uh, from other voices, um, people who might not be able to participate in the past. And so I, I do hope we have hearings across the country, um, you know, different commodities, but then we're going to still hear from a variety of producers on, you know, on their needs. You know, and, and we do believe, um, you know, in, in speaking with Sarah's staff, now staff, you know, while we haven't set any dates, we do believe their, their hearings will begin next year. Um, with that, I just sort of want to offer a couple of observations of some of the things that I've, I've just seen since I've come back to the committee, or joined the committee in July. Yeah. Unfortunately, it seems, you know, I guess if I had to I would pick up some of the things I'm seeing from the administration, there seems to be just a feeling of, I get that either they don't understand or worse, they don't care. Um, you know, as I look collectively at the decisions of the Biden administration with regard to production of agriculture, you know, I, I come to the conclusion that they either don't understand the impacts of what they're doing to American farmers, America's farmers and ranchers, or worse, they don't care. You know, decisions from USDA and the EPA just seem completely out of touch and intended to serve non-agricultural purposes. Um, one example, I'll give you a couple examples. You know, one example, this year's CRP sign up. Um, and, and we look at this, you know, across the country, obviously, you know, and we believe USDA exceeds their statutory authority on you know, rental rates. and they enrolled productive farmland in order to meet, you know, um, an administration goal on land conservation. You know, and it took land out of production. Um, you know, they had to lower the scoring of eligible lands to meet their enrolled land goals. You know, the renewable energy policy you're hearing, um, you know, they want 50% of the cars in the United States to be electric in the coming decades. Is that really the only way to reach some of of these emission goals, you know, what about the impact to the biofuels industries and the farmers who supply the feedstocks? 
how is this renewable electricity going to be generated? You know, I suspect more productive farmland will be taken out of production to service sites for wind turbines and solar arrays. And, and let me be clear, I, I never want the federal government to tell someone what they can and can't do with their land. And if a farmer wants to turn all of his land into a solar farm, that's his right. But it is. But I just wonder, is anyone in the administration considering the ripple effects of all of these, these decisions on agriculture? And finally, Paul talked about this too, you know, crop protection issues. You know, EPA announcements on important crop protection tools, especially when it goes outside their, their processes their, that we have you know, known to uh, participate in, you know, really creates havoc. You take the decision on chlorpyrifos, you know, it's the only tool for certain crops and certain pests, and the EPA really can't even answer basic questions right now about what's going to happen with the crops that were produced uh, with chlorpyrifos. You know, what about the future of glyphosate and atrazine? Um, you know, what about over-the-top applications of dicamba? You know, it just seems like the, the administration doesn't understand the impacts of these announcements and the uncertainty they, they cause. And, you know, should these tools be um, taken away from producers, you know, what will happen to yields and future planning decisions and, and those things? You know, when you couple supply chain issues with regulatory, oh, excuse me, regulatory issues, you know, it really is a very difficult mix for y'all to operate in. Um, it concerns me. And then finally, um, you know, I want to talk about the pumps as well. Um, the last thing I did for Senator Cochran in 2018 uh, was negotiate about the pumps. It is the only thing I focused on, it seems like, uh, on that appropriations bill. And we went to the absolute uh, end of the process. It was the last issue to finally be dealt with. Um, and we didn't prevail. And it was personally painful for me, especially it was Senator Cochran's last time as the chairman of the committee. And after somebody had worked for 40 years on this and uh, the importance it was to the Delta, it, it, it definitely was something that stung me very, very badly. Um, uh, and so I have a little bit of opinion on this matter. Um, what amazes me is, is the administration has been very, um, you know, very quick to say that they're very pro environmental justice and that you know they they want to solve these issues and it just if you look at the impact of, to the communities um, as you all know you know 70 percent of the population of the Yazoo backwater is minority 30 percent of the population lives in poverty um, and it just seems like the Biden administration just decided that the lives and the livelihoods and the property of some of the poorest people in the country weren't worth protecting if it risked the disapproval from the environmentalists on the left. And that's really distressing. Um, I do think much praise should be given Senator Wicker and Senators Wicker and Hot Smith. Um, I know many staff worked on too, and I know Hunter and Hunt worked on as well. Um, and also I'd like to just say that Daniel Ulmer from Senator Hot Smith's office also has been a tireless um, advocate for the pumps. I've frankly never seen a staffer work harder on an issue than what I've seen coming out of Daniel 